I want you all to picture a nerd. <laughs> now raise a hand if this person was a girl. Oh yeah, you got some people. Now raise a hand if this person had glasses. Yeah, like everyone. <laughs> okay, now raise a hand if this person had a good fashion sense. No one, that's right. <laughs> now look at me. Would you consider me a nerd? However, I'm a girl, and I do have glasses, and I'm wearing a light-up dress. How is that even possible? I'm a 15-year-old who enjoys science and fashion, and I defy the stereotypical nerd by being myself, Grace Buckwater. One of the many fascinating things about the brain is that it's full of billions of microscopic nerve cells called neurons, which transfer information to other neurons through electrical impulses. This electrical activity can be picked up through EEG, which stands for electroencephalogram. That one's a fun one. Usually when scientists are collecting brain waves, they place a cap with multiple electrodes onto the patient. In order to get a strong signal, the electrodes must be touching the skin on the skull of a patient. This method doesn't always work, so scientists use conductive gel to get a stronger signal. Now, at this point, you might be able to tell, and you might not, but you're probably wondering why I'm wearing this dress and why is it changing colors. For my science fair project, I combine fashion, motivation, and my brain to make a piece of wearable technology that visually communicates the wearer's brainwave. And just to clarify, this is science, not magic. And it's not rocket science, it's just brain science. All you have to do is use your head. It all starts here. This is a MindFlex headpiece that is used for a game that has a user levitate a ball by concentrating. To do so, it has an electrode that is placed in the middle of my forehead. The electrode picks up the electrical impulses, aka brain waves, from the part of my brain called the frontal lobe. I found online a hack to get the raw brain wave data from my MindFlex onto my computer. MindFlex also wrote an algorithm that translated the brainwaves into attention and meditation values. There are five major types of brainwaves. Alpha, beta, theta, delta, and gamma. The attention values are based on beta brainwaves, and the meditation values are based on alpha brainwaves. So if we can dim the lights a little bit. Oh, boy. Oh, perfect, okay. So, as, ooh, that got loud. as you can see, on the outside, which is currently blue, you have to trust it's the outside layer, is my attention rate. In the middle is meditation, which is also blue. And, well, now it's purple. And on the inside is the signal strength of the device, which is currently green, which is good. So once I got these values onto my computer, I then wrote code to match a color to the strength of these individual values. For example, red being the weakest, then blue, then purple, then green being the strongest. I can influence these values by doing a variety of different activities. Now, before I do my demonstration, I should say that I'm also a music student. I've enjoyed playing the bass in multiple orchestras and jazz bands since fourth grade. So naturally, I have a forte for music, and as I was making this dress, I was curious to see what it would look like on my dress when I listened to music. I chose a song that portrayed a variety of different emotions and styles. And yes, it could be classified as classical music. And I'm sorry if that bores you. So if you doze off, I will not be offended. Yeah. Also, I'm just a little bit nervous. So please give me some time to calm down. And you can watch as the colors change on my dress. Hopefully, we can get the music started. Here we go.
brought my dress to science fair, judges, students, and adults came up to my project and were absolutely astonished by my dress. Some kids would come up to my project saying they heard about the girl in the electronic dress and wanted to hear about my project. When I heard this, I was shocked. Kids were talking about my project? What? But I loved explaining it to them, and I could tell they were interested and were trying to figure out how it worked. These students at Science Fair are gifted in skills in critical thinking and STEAM. STEAM is similar to STEM, as in it includes science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. However, STEAM also includes art, which would be my dress. And the whole purpose of Science Fair is for kids to come together and to share their findings and inspire one another. I love Science Fair because I can see what other kids my age are working on and meet friends they may not have otherwise. Science Fair also gives kids who aren't book smart a chance to show off their creative skills that they normally wouldn't be able to show off in a standard science classroom. It also teaches kids to accept failure and to learn from it. I wouldn't be here today without Science Fair. Now, let's be real. I'm definitely not the smartest person in the room right now. But I use my resources and my motivation to be successful. I believe you don't have to be the smartest person to be successful. Has anyone here ever heard of Professor Sir John Gordon? If you didn't, he received a Nobel Peace Prize in, two, Nobel Prize in 2012 in medicine and psychology. He proved, through series of, he proved through an experiment that all the cells in the body contain the same genes. This experiment led into research in cloning, where he cloned frogs, and later led into the research of the cloning, of, into the cloning of the sheep Dolly. So, as you can tell, he's probably a pretty smart guy, but not everyone thought that. In high school, he ranked at the bottom of his class in every subject in science. Not only that, but on one of his reports, his professor wrote, and I quote, I believe he has ideas about becoming a scientist. On his present showing, this is quite ridiculous. And later quotes, it would be a sheer waste of time, both on his part and for those who have to teach him. I bet he regrets that now, but. <laughs> My point in mentioning this is that grades are not everything. As I was visiting colleges over the summer, I noticed that many students' biggest fear was getting a grade other than an A. And I believe that there's such a ridiculously high standard on kids to get all A's and yet take extremely rigorous classes. All that the standard is doing is making these kids afraid of failure. By always being able to get an A on every single test and assignment, they're not prepared for failure. Not to mention that the tests that were supposed to test our children's depth of knowledge are now testing who can take the test the best. My question is, how is the skill of test taking ever going to be used in the workforce or to advance humanity? Let's go back to Sir Gordon. He was rejected for not having the capacity to learn from books, but he took the knowledge he did know, whether it's vast or minimal, and applied it to problems that affected him, that he wanted to solve. And he failed. Everyone does. I failed continuously during the making of my dress, and I loved every minute of it. Just kidding, I hated it. <laughs> Oh my god, but that's normal. We have to fail in order to learn. So when Sir Gordon failed continuously, what kept him going? Motivation. He took this negativity and he used it as motivation to try harder and to prove to his professor that he was in fact smart and capable of being successful. He took something that could tear someone down and proved it wrong. He accepted failure and to this day, that notes is framed on his desk. In my, pro in my project, my motivation was my mom. She has suffered from migraines for over 35 years. There are multiple types of migraine, including migraine with aura and migraine without aura. Migraine with aura means there are symptoms that occur before the migraine starts. Common symptoms include nausea and sensitivity to sight and sound. This type of migraine occurs in about one out of three people who have migraines. Migraine without aura means there are no symptoms that occur before the migraine starts. This type of migraine is more common and occurs in about two out of three people who have migraines. Growing up, 
my sisters and I knew when my, when my mom would have a migraine, and because she has migraine with aura, there had to be no loud noises and lights had to be kept down. But only recently it hit me that I grew up with the reality that my mom would get migraine so bad. She had to stay in a dark room for hours, even days at a time, unable to do anything. This disorder restricted my mom from doing daily activities including work and attending important life events. But she is not alone. Migraine affects about 12% of the American population. That is over 37 million people in similar situations. One of the saddest things about migraines and other neurological disorders is that there's so little research as to what causes them and how they can be so different from person to person. For example, we don't even know what causes migraine. We've managed them rockets to other planets and so much more, and yet we don't even know what's going on in our own head and how the brain works. And what happens when something in the brain doesn't work? Everyone's brain is different. Even identical twins have different brains. That's what makes neuroscience so beautiful and fascinating. However, this and the lack of knowledge in the field also creates an obstacle in treatment of these disorders. Treatment is done on a case-by-case -case trial basis. In other words, treatment is a science experiment where the doctor prescribes multiple medicines to each, to each patient to see whether the drugs help eliminate or prevent the pain. Treatments range from Botox to epilepsy medicine. However, each of these drugs have numerous side effects, putting the patient in danger. Patients, including my mom, have ended up in the hospital from these treatment drugs. By growing up seeing my mom suffer from migraines and no one really knowing how to cure or prevent them, I knew I wanted to help her and others who suffer from migraines and other neurological disorders. So that brings me here with my dress. As I said before, the manufacturer of the MindFlex wrote an algorithm that translated the brainwaves into attention and meditation values. My question is, what if I can take the brain take the brainwaves of a migraine patient and can find trends in them for early detection of a migraine. This would be huge because, as I said before, the migraine patients without aura means there are no symptoms that occur before the migraine starts. So they have no idea when a migraine is about to occur. If they have the capability to know when a migraine is about to start, they could take treatment and possibly even prevent the migraine. That being said, detecting migraines in brainwaves and writing an algorithm for early detection of brain or migraines is easier said than done. So I'll have to conduct quite a bit of research and experimentation, which means, yup, you guessed it, many more failures just waiting to happen. <laughs> but it also means a lot of learning, which I look forward to. Now, failure isn't fun. No one comes home and says, Mom, guess what? I bombed my math test. I mean, I used to think that bombing a test meant you got an A, so unless you mean it in that context, probably not a good thing. But after you've failed numerous times, and you finally got it right, the feeling of success is beyond words. And that is what makes all your troubles worth it. And as Albert Einstein once said, if we knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it? <laughs> and here's my message to you. Remember to accept failure and to never let stereotypes hold you back. Find what motivates you. Make connections with people and resources in the field. And through motivation and dedication, you'll be surprised what you accomplish. Thank you.